superstar. Did you say superstar? <laughs> this is really embarrassing. Um, hi everyone. Um, I'm Oki Sato. I'm the founder and chief designer of a design firm called Nendo. Uh, Nendo is based in Tokyo and we have a small space in Milan and in Singapore as well. Um, I was born in, in Toronto and I grew up until I was 10 years old and it's my first time to come back here since 25 years so it feels really great to be back. I'm really excited. Uh, even though I don't look excited, I am. Um, this is what happens when you live in Japan for 25 years, I guess. Um, so when I was 10, I was a normal Canadian kid. I was, I was cheering for the Maple Leafs and the Blue Jays, and I hope they still exist. Um, and then we didn't still have the, the dome. I think it was called the Sky Dome. They were still building that dome. And anyways, I was a normal kid going to Cub Scouts and uh, going to camps and things like that. And suddenly one day, you move to Tokyo. It's so different. Um, really chaotic place and I would see things slightly differently than the normal Japanese kids would do. It was, I think that, that helps me out in how I design things. It's about observing things, and um, it's about enjoying the boring stuff. And uh, after that, I studied architecture at school. And in 2002, which is about 10 years ago, I went to the furniture fair in Milan, the design fair in Milan, and I noticed that design was something that makes people happy. It's something that's really exciting. And that's how we started as Nendo. And Nendo means uh, clay in Japanese. It's, it's more like Play-Doh, I guess. The flexibility, changing shapes and sizes and, and colors as you mix different colors. Um, so that was exactly the way that I wanted to work as a designer. And um, I think I'll show you my first project that I did uh, in 2002 or 2003. Um, it's an interior project. And um, the client was an old friend of mine from junior high school. And he gave me a phone call. And he said that he found a very beautiful house, like a small building inside of Tokyo. But there's a, there's a nice river by it. And uh, it's almost like Paris, that's what he said. It's, it's like the, the same river, and then there's a very um, beautiful scene there. So, I went to the site, and what I saw was this, um, the building. This was the building, and this was the same river that he said. Um, I thought maybe the, he was thinking about something else when he said Paris. I didn't know that there are so many different Parises in the world. Um, this black, black thing here was the river, is the river, and the end result was something like this. The, the river was still bad, but uh, the building got a bit bad, better, I guess. Um, at night time, it became something like this, when the fluorescent lights go on. Um, the only problem was that after opening, like after one year of opening, there were so many people coming into the restaurant and asking when is the restaurant going to open because it looked like a construction site and the, the people working in the restaurant had to explain that it's, it's open, it's, it's open for more than a year. Um, but, uh, oh yes, yeah, so the interior, um, I, I bought, I didn't buy, it was almost like I found these um, furniture, it was almost like junk, but uh, I don't know how I found it, but I found the, the tables and the chairs, and since I still had about 100 meters of fabric left, I started wrapping up the chairs and the tables as well. Uh, I, I still had like 30 or 40 meters left, so then I started printing the logos and, and maps on the, on the fabric, and I cut them up and I used them as cards and things like that. So in the end, I used 300 meters of the fabric, and that's the way we sort of managed the budget in the end. Um, it was a it was a tough project, but uh, it was edited. It was shown in a lot of magazines and, and television, and uh, it helped us out in the beginning, I guess. And uh, one of one of the, the the people who liked this restaurant was the fashion designer Issey Miyake, and uh, there's only 16. 
seats in the restaurant, but uh, he really liked the place. So he would come here, um, I don't know, a few times a month. And uh, when a guest comes along from, from Europe or something, he would, he would rent this, this big bus then he would have 40 guests coming into this restaurant. I don't know how he managed to have 40 guests in this in this restaurant, but he was a he was a fan of this restaurant. So I guess that's that helped me out when we started working together, collaborating together. Okay, so um, well, this was the first project. Now I'm working on about 220 to 230 projects at the same time. Um, at that time, we were a team of five designers. Now we are about 35 designers, so um, I guess that's good in a way. Um, okay, so today I'm gonna explain about two things that I, that I hate. Um, one thing is talking in front of large audiences, so be nice to me today. Um, I guess the last time I did something like this was six or seven years ago. Hmm. And the second thing that I hate is, I don't hate interviews, but I hate um, rough questions from interviewers, uh, like, uh, what do you do on weekends? What is your favorite food? What's your favorite color? Um, what's the trend of this year? What's the trend of next year? Um, and the worst question would be, I guess, this one, uh, what is design? Um, it, it, it's a very difficult question for me to answer. But I think I'll try. I'll try to answer this question um, the way I see design. So for me, uh, design is not about colors or forms or creating something that's really different, but it's about finding things, um, noticing small differences in everyday life, and trying to capture those small moments then try to recreate it into something that's easier to understand and to share it with people. So it's not about making things, but it's more about observing and it's about capturing those moments. And I, I really feel that those moments, those small moments of happiness or surprise or those small emotional movements is what makes everyday life so rich and interesting. So I guess design in the end has to be something that makes people happy. Then the next question would be why do those small moments or small ideas, do, why do they have to be so small? Um, designers tend to make big ideas to make a big difference but I try to not, I try not to think of it that way. Um, there's a thing called the butterfly effect, I think it was part of the uh, uh, chaos theory or something, but it was like uh, a butterfly flying in Shanghai or Beijing or something and the wind which is created by that butterfly so it develops and then by the time the wind goes to I don't know Seattle or some Texas or it becomes this uh, strong wind it becomes like a tornado. I feel that design should be something like that. It shouldn't start from big things, big ideas, but it has to be, it has to start from small ideas, very, very tiny ideas that no, not many people would even care. But uh, gradually, those small ideas would develop into something big in the end. That would be the ideal way of designing things. So when I was studying architecture in school, um, I was told by my teacher to see things from a very high point of view. How first designing the city, designing the streets, and then thinking about how the buildings should be designed, and then thinking about the interiors, and then the furniture and the objects that are placed on the furniture. That's, that's the way design should be. So it's like a top-down way of thinking of things. But after 10 years of working, I feel the totally the opposite way. I think I would like to start from a very small object like this glass, and then I can think about how the table should be, how the room should be, and the building, and then gradually that small idea for this glass could develop into the, the city, like a bottom-up way of thinking of things. Um, this would be my way of thinking. So it's more like the media, I guess. It's not like... Um, televisions or newspapers, they give you all this information, but now we have the social media um, that somebody on the other side of the world would notice that it's interesting, and then it develops into uh, 
huge information in the end. I think that is exactly the way design works at this time. Then, um, I guess the next question would be, how can we find these small moments in, in everyday life? And I think that there are several tips, maybe three or four. Uh, the first thing is not to uh, focus on things. When you start focusing, when you think about trying to design this glass, you really look at glass objects or you start researching. What you're doing is you're ignoring the, the good stuff around it. Uh, when you focus, it means that the, the surroundings, you're not seeing it correctly. So I try not to see the object itself, but to see things in a blurry way. Um, that really helps me to find these small ideas. So it's the totally opposite way that the teachers tell you to focus on what you're doing or something like that. The next thing would be um, to relax and not to, to find things. It's like something, uh, you lose your keys or your mobile phone or something, and uh, you try to look for it, you find thing, you try to find it, but it's never there. And then you're doing something else and then it just pops out. It's something like that. When you try to find ideas, you never find interesting ideas because um, everyone's trying to find interesting ideas. It's more like you are like a net or a filter or something. You're not, it's not like fishing. Um, it's, you're not putting the bait and things like that, but you're just a net, you're just going through the water and then all these stuff like garbage or small fish or things would be caught in the net. And then sometimes you find something that is small but quite interesting. And that's the way I try to design, that's the way I try to find, not find, but try to uh, catch maybe small ideas. The next tip would be, um, I guess a lot of designers, they hate routine work. Um, they want to do something different every day, but uh, that doesn't help me in any way. Um, I go to the same cafe, have the same cappuccino, I walk to the same streets, and then I walk to the park. Um, at lunchtime, I go to the same restaurant, I have the same a uh, bowl of noodles, it's, 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 it's a boring life, I'm a boring person. But uh, that really helps me the way I design things. When you keep on continuing the same things every day, you notice those small differences in everyday life. And a large B. But uh, when you see A, B, A, B, B, you notice that there's a large B, there's something there, there's a slight difference. You notice that there's a small moment there. So that's the way I try to find ideas. Um, so I notice that there's a small D here and then there's a small six maybe, I don't know. It's something like that. It's something that is continuous and then you bump into small ideas. And then when you find these ideas, it's about how to record that idea into your brain because uh, I feel that the, the brain is made to to forget things, I guess, S especially the small things. People tend to forget. So what I try to do is to convert that idea from the right brain to the left brain, or is it the other way, or whatever. Um, I try to think logically why I felt that way. Why do I feel so, let's say there's a, a glass filled with water here in the middle of the table, I feel safe. But when this comes over here, for instance, um, I get a bit worried when I'm talking. It's something like that. Why do I feel worried? You think that way. And then I think, how could I create that emotion by designing things? That, that is designed for me. It's not about creating different shapes or forms or, or materials, colors. That comes later on, I guess. It's more about how people feel about things or this, how people feel about that situation. Um, and then, after 10 years of creating this boring routine, I noticed that there are several small rules um, in that small surprising movement, a moment. <clears throat> and that is, um, it felt like A instead of B. So it's, this sounds kind of strange, but 
Okay, so first there's something that seems very solid and heavy, but it's soft. So it felt soft instead of solid or hard. It's something like that. Those create those small emotions. Or there's this long corridor, but uh, when you walk in, you bump into a, a mirror. So you thought it was a long corridor, but actually there was a large mirror reflecting the corridor. Things like that. Or um, you're walking down the street and you thought it started to rain or something. But actually there was a guy sneezing on top of you or something like that. This is a nice but you thought it was, uh, it, it was rain, but it was something else. Um, these are, I think this is a very basic rule. This is the basic rule when you're thinking about small ideas. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, so, as a designer, I would try to think, how could I make it feel like A instead of B? And that way I can create these small moments in everyday life. So the thing is, there is a slight difference to design A and to design something that feels like A. Um, there is a big difference and I would prefer the one that feels like A. Because to design A is, you have to design the object. There is a physical reality. There is. It is the object, but when you try to think about something that feels like A, um, it, it's something in, that is in people's minds, it's, and it's, I think it, it's slightly different the way people feel it is A. So that means I have uh, this broadness. I feel very free and f uh, flexible in a way, way when I start thinking about ideas. Um, this is a very old painting. Um, called This Is Not A Pipe. Um, it's one of my favorite paintings, but uh, so if this is not a pipe, what is it? It's, it's something that feels like a pipe, um, but it's not, I guess. So it, that's the way it, it generates your imagination in a way. You're, you're letting your mind free because it's not a pipe. It's something that feels like a pipe. So you have all this freedom to think about what is it. It, it creates space for your in, inside of your mind. Um, this is exactly the way I try to see things, try to work on things, and to design things. Um, or maybe I can have uh, this big sheet of. Well, I don't know why, but this always happens to me. Uh, come on. Okay. Okay, so I can have this big sheet of red glass or plastic, something that seems red, then the white chair becomes a red chair for me. Or I can give my client a pair of red glasses and that would become a red chair as well. Or I can give my client uh, a green sheet of paper, let him stare at that for 30 seconds, and then when he sees the white chair, it might seem like a red chair something like that you can that is a red chair for me as well or i can maybe design the environment its surroundings maybe i can have a blue background and place a purple chair that might seem red because of the contrast or um, i can finish the chair in litmus paper i think that's something that reacts to acid so i can leave that chair outside for, I don't know, two or three weeks. And then the chair would eventually become red because of the acid uh, inside of the rain. So then this generates another message. I'm not creating a red chair, but what I'm creating is another message by using that red chair. So I think this is what I'm trying to do in the end. I'm not trying to make chairs or tables or um, things like that, but it's a story that I'm trying to generate. Um, the story behind the object is much more interesting for me than the object itself. This is getting more technical, but maybe I make these folds on the chair, finish one side in white, the other side in red, 
then when I show it to uh, the mother and child, maybe, the mother might see it as a white chair, but the child, for the child, it's a red chair because of the difference of the eye level. So now what I'm trying to do here is to, to target to a certain person or a certain group of people. Um, so this is, this is the way I would design things, especially when I work on packaging or um, industrial design. It's about who you want to develop, uh, deliver this message. So I guess this is the way we need to think about design. It's not about making cool things or amazing things, but it has to become a message in the end. So, if a client comes along and tells me to design a red chair, I can design white chairs, blue chairs, purple. I, I don't have to design red chairs. It's not about uh, having a red paint and just to finish the chair in red, but I have all this freedom to design different kind of chairs. There's so many different ways of solving this problem, which makes it so interesting and so exciting to design things. So, um, I think it was two years ago when uh, the Taiwanese government uh, came along and asked me to design a furniture, a piece of furniture made of bamboo. Um, so, there was like a four day tour around Taiwan looking at all these bamboo forests and meeting the craftsmen and so on. And, but the thing that I noticed was bamboo is bamboo. It's, it's the same in Japan, it's the same in China. Uh, bamboo is uh, a, a certain material. And um, I thought it was much more interesting to work on the details of, of bamboo furniture. It's not the bamboo that is interesting, but it was the way the people treat bamboo. For instance, this is like slicing part of the bamboo and then since it becomes more flexible, they can bend it. So that's the way they make these corners or they, they find a bigger uh, uh, pipe, uh, like a bigger piece of bamboo which is a di bigger diameter. So they create these kind of joints or this is another way of creating a corner, but uh, they, they slice part of it and then they wrap another piece of bamboo so it becomes very solid. This is another way of creating a joint, but they make these cuts and then they snap it in between using the uh, flexibility of bamboo again. Uh, or this one was quite interesting. They have this very um, big piece of bamboo and they would start slicing it and then they would weave it to create surfaces. So. Uh, what I thought was, I'm not going to make uh, uh, furniture that is made of bamboo, but I'm going to make a furniture that feels that it, as, if, as if it were made of bamboo. And so what I presented the week later was something like this. It's, um, it's furniture made of steel pipes. Uh, because I noticed that uh, the characters of of steel pipes and bamboo is quite similar and steel pipes are much more industrial in a way. But uh, the people of the Taiwanese government was really pissed off because <laughs> they asked for a bamboo chair and I'm making a steel chair and they, they're thinking that this designer is crazy or something and uh, so I had to explain that what's interesting is not the bamboo itself, it's not the material but it's how you guys treat the material. And um, in the end, they were very happy, and uh, it, we're trying to make it into an industrial piece as well, into a mass-produced piece. Um, so it's really interesting to, to see the, um, the bamboo craftsmen um, inside of the metal workshop, and they were discussing things about the details, how usually they would work with bamboo, and they were trying to apply that technique to these steel pipes. Like, as you can see, the bending and the, the interlocking and the weaving. The weaving of the steel was quite interesting as well. This is a nice piece as well. This was part of the collection. Uh, we asked them to, to slice these aluminium pipes and we started weaving them and welding at the same time. And uh, the support underneath is using the, the cuts, the, the slicing, and then it's wrapped around the other piece. 
So this is the way I, I design things in general, I guess. It's not about creating different forms, amazing colors, but it's about finding things, bumping into things that is interesting and trying to make it happen. When I start thinking about design, um, it's very difficult for me to categorize all of my work into these 10 different keywords, but uh, it's, I think it's, it's a mixture of these keywords. So it's about outline, error, process, multiply, link, conceal, skin, balance, fold, and magnifying. Um, first would be to outline things. It's, it's about finding borders in everyday life. I feel that the world is made of different borders. Maybe light and shadow, um, maybe some things are or mine and yours, or the inside and the outside. Um, it's about finding or noticing these borderlines and uh, trying to shift it slightly or to make it blurry sometimes. And it makes a big difference sometimes. It's, that's the way I design things in a way. This is um, a collection of furniture called the Thin Black Lines that I showed in at the Saatchi Gallery in London, it was two years ago, it was trying to create new functions and volumes, this is like a coat hanger, um, creating objects using only the borderlines, about outlining things. Um, it wasn't about using luxurious materials or anything like that, it's just steel metal, but to create something different and special. These are tables and we made an outline of the vase so that the top part of the vase supports the flowers and the bottom part becomes like a tray for the water. Um, this is an office that we did in Japan. This again was about thinking about borders, about privacy and how we can open up spaces in between or, or close space between. Um, it wasn't about creating walls and doors and things or it wasn't about having these screens that are used for offices, but we wanted to find something in between so that when you sit down you have your own privacy, but when you stand up you can talk to anyone because there's a link between uh, the different spaces. And also the thing on the bottom, I think, by walking on top of it, you're, you're, it, it, it becomes another border, I think. This is something very Japanese, I think. It's not about um, doors or things like that, but it's about you passing through one of those borders. It's like the tatami uh, mattresses. You're not allowed to walk on the edges where the fabric detailing is because that is a border, and you're not allowed to walk on those traditionally. It's something like that, I guess. The next keyword would be to create errors. Um, design is about solving problems, but sometimes you need to create problems. No, this, uh, this doesn't make sense at all, but uh, hmm. it's about to create solving problems in the wrong way. Um, so for instance, this was uh, a booth that I made for a trade show in Japan. It seems like objects, front pieces of furniture are placed on the floor with spotlights. But what it is was that I didn't have a budget for spotlights or walls or anything, so I printed these spotlights on the floor and I just placed the objects. And uh, it's about doing things the wrong way, I guess. Uh, there were so many people from the lighting companies and manufacturers of lighting coming along and asking me what kind of spotlights am I using because it was really focused lighting. Um, from a very high ceiling and I would tell them that there's a very sharp LED light on the ceiling and everyone would start trying to find that, that spotlight and it was so funny. Um, so this is the way I placed the chair the second day because no, not many people notice that it's a printed thing on the floor. Um, so that, that's one way of solving things. Uh, this is a collection of, of watches. Uh, Noon is a brand in, based in Copenhagen. And uh, they're good at working on these disk systems. And they use a lot of colors. But I told them that I don't want to use any colors. I can show the disk system in a different way. And so this idea was about splitting one arm into two different 
uh, in a shorter arm and a longer arm. Or this was a watch that tells time by using these small watches. So the, the short arm would be moving around and then exactly on that time it tells the time. I, I don't know, I can't explain this. Um, gears that are usually hidden inside become visible. Um, the, the golden dots tell the time, I guess, something like that. Or a chronographic watch, which the, the dial starts to move around, telling the minutes and the hours. So it's, it's not the arms that are moving, but the, 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 the dial parts are moving. Or this one's a tricky one. Um, the, the, 12th, the part of the two splits, and then it slowly moves to the three, and then it becomes a three. Um, and then, in, yeah, that's a three, okay. And then it goes to the bottom part, it becomes part of the six, and then it moves on and it, becomes, it, it completes nine. So what I did was I, I broke up the numbers, and then I moved part of the number to the short arm so that it tells time, but it, I don't know, you expect to see this moment, I don't know. It was something like that. Or this is a vase that I made, I don't know, six or seven years ago. Um, it looks like a mirror, but I placed two different vases on the frame, so I could place two different flowers, or maybe only a flower on one side. So it's the error that I'm trying to create. Or these are window displays that I designed for Todd's last year during the, the Furniture Fair in Milan. Um, was about making pieces of furniture that start to open in the wrong way. Um, but in that way I can attract the attention. And also since I have this big box so I can fill it with light, um, the product seems very nice in the window. Third keyword would be process. Um, I feel that uh, it's not the final object, it's, it's about the process more. Um, I think process defines the quality of the object. So for instance, this is a chair that I made in, oh I don't remember, uh, 2007 or something. It's a chair made of paper. It was a collaboration with the fashion designer Issey Miyake. So he has his own uh, his brand called uh, Please Please. And what it is is that he has two sheets of thin paper, he puts the fabric in between and he lets it go through the machine with steam and heat and then that's how it's pleated. And then after it's pleated he takes the roll out and then he rips it out. So one day he gave me a phone call he said that he wants me to make a chair using that paper because he thought it was a pity that he's throwing away all this paper. So what I did was, this is the way it's thrown away from the factory and I tried to mix it with different materials but it didn't work and then what I started doing was I tried to cut one sheet of paper tried to peel it, then I cut again, peeled it again, cut again, peeled it again and then it became something like a chair um, and, I, and I showed it to Mr. Miyake and he said it looks like a cabbage so that's the reason why it's called the cabbage chair um, and I said that I have to finish the chair because it, it doesn't look comfortable, it's more like a stool. And he said, no, 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 you, you don't have to finish it, it's, it's finished. So that was quite shocking for me because when I was studying design or architecture in school, my teachers told me to finish your project. You have to make renderings, models, you have to simulate everything, you have to finish the project. But for Mr. Miyake, he said that you have to stop when you feel it's finished. Um, I, that's one of the ways that I found that process is not always the same. It's something that you have to control um, by stretching it or, or reversing it or compressing it. You can make so many different designs by controlling the process. This is the cabbage chair with the fabric inside. Um, this is a fairly new project that I did with a French brand called Bacala. Um, this was for Tokyo Design Tide, so it was in October. Um, I only had one month for this project. He, Bakara showed me this glass called the Arcour, and uh, 
they said that we cannot make molds or anything. All you can do is to print something on the surface. And I didn't want to do that. I don't know why, but that didn't sound interesting because that does not, um, that does not Able me, enable me to focus on the, the, the real character of this object. So what I made was the right one. Um, I was given the left one, I made the right one. What I did was, when I saw the manufacturing process of this glass, after they cut the, the crystal, and when they polish it, it since the, the cutting is so small, they dip it into this big um, pool of acid for a few seconds so that it melts the surface so that it, it's polished um, and then I asked them to dip it in longer and then they would say uh, it would melt and then I thought that that would be so interesting because it's like the crystal is like like glass almost uh, like ice almost so the end result was something like this it changed the silhouette a bit but um, the feel was very nice it was so soft and um, I think I was able to find a new perspective, a new um, charm to this piece. This was a tumbler that we melted as well. Um, so the detailing was something like this. So I'm not sure if this is design or not, but for me this is design as well. It's about just changing slightly the process of making things. This was a lamp that I made with uh, Bohemian glass blowers. I was sitting in, in one of their workshops and I would notice that everyone's blowing, of course, because they're glass blowers, but I asked them to stop blowing and then I asked them to suck the air out. And they're laughing in the beginning, but when they tried it, we noticed that we can create these kind of organic um, wrinkles on the surface, which looked very nice when there was light inside. So um, in the end, we made it into a lamp like this. So um, now they're getting better and better. They're producing more of these lamps in, in, in Czech. And uh, they're, they're becoming very good glass suckers now. Um, the fourth one would be multiplying things. Um, it's, like, it's like the leaves of the tree. It, you're copying and pasting, copying and pasting, but it's not always the same. It's, the, you create a new meaning to that. Like when you see a tree, even though the leaves are grown in the same rule, uh, the timing when the leaves are, are grown or where the position of the leaves, it, they all have a different character, they all have a different meaning. So that's one of the things that I like doing. By multiplying things, you find something interesting within that. This is a, 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 a birdhouse that I designed last year called the Bird Apartment because it's like 120 something birdhouses in one, one building. And there's a large opening in the backside of, the, of this birdhouse so that the people can come in and there's these peepholes so you can enjoy watching the 100 something birds inside something like that um, or this was an exhibition design that I did in Japan um, again we had a very low budget so we used um, greenhouses how do you call those those glass boxes that are used for plants and things like that since it has glass already, the aluminum frames are very easily set up without using so many tools. Um, and it has light inside as well, so I didn't have to design anything. I just placed it at, in a grid and I had all these pieces exhibited inside as like showcases. This was another exhibition that I did in Tokyo. I created, I pressed fake hats. I don't remember, so like 4,000 fake hats and then I had them floating in the air. So they become fuser, uh, diffusers for the light, they become pedestals for the hats, they become pass they create passageways. All these hats would do everything for me. And by having 4,000 fake hats, I was able to create a contrast between the real hats. They, you could see all the detail work, the handwork that is done on the hats. Uh, so this was a karaoke box that I made karaoke room, um, I thought what would be the in most interesting place to sing, and it was the bathtub, so the bathroom. So I made this big bathtub um, so people could sit inside and sing, and then I have these showers as coat hooks. 
I, I think I made these these taps as uh, diffusers for the light. So if you twist one, it becomes the hot one. It, the, the the light coming from underneath becomes red, and when I twist the the cool one, it becomes blue. And so you can mix your perfect colors, something like that. Or this was uh, a cake that I designed with a Japanese patissier, and it was about it not only being served on a plate. But you're you you're um, sort of you're creating the cake while you're eating it. So um, it w I thought about having these different colors of chocolate pencils, like having different amounts of milk inside, and then there would be a sharpener beside it, so you can start sharpening your your pencil. But the trash part becomes the part that you eat. So it's. Many things are going on here, but that was an idea for the chocolate cake. This was about creating a link between these picture frames and rock climbing as well. It was, this was one of the most difficult uh, projects that I did in the past because we had to design these picture frames that look like picture frames, but they have to be functional. Um, they have to work as, as, a, as a sport as well. Or these are um, I don't know, things that hold the mobile phone. They asked me to design a tray for a mobile phone, but this was the way I designed it. Or this was an exhibition that I did in uh, London at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, they gave me, showed me 11 different spaces to, to, pe uh, to create a bench or something, so I said I wanted to use all 11 spaces. And I noticed that each space has its own character, so I wanted to make a chair that kind of mimics the space. So it's called the mimicry chairs. So the chairs would be sitting on the stairs. Um, there would be a, a chair that has a window, and because it's placed in front of a large window, or um, it ha I placed a, a chair that is is like this uh, uh, like this staircase. Or this was a this was a chair which has all these frames because it's for, it was for this this room for for carpets. Or this room had so many different sized uh, picture frames, so I designed different sized different chairs which has different proportions as well. So it was quite kind of interesting. This was beside the elevator, so I had these chairs being elevated in a way. So it was interesting that people were walking around trying to look for all of all eleven um, benches or, or chairs, and it was it was kind of nice. And it 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 was a it was a real collaboration with the, the environment. So it wasn't only about objects and space, but there was a very nice collaboration between those two objects. Um, this was a, a pop-up store that I did in Tokyo for Starbucks. What I did was I created a link between books and coffee because I felt that it's something that makes you relax or it's uh, something that creates your own space when you start reading or when you have a cup of coffee. So I made this big bookshelf so that people could choose a cup of coffee like you're choosing uh, your favorite book. So I had nine different book covers uh, I don't remember what it was. Was it was like mocha or cappuccino or latte or things like that. And then inside of the books, there would be all this text and illustrations about what the coffee, what that drink is about, and they would choose. And then, if you bring it to the the counter, they would give you that cup of coffee together with this book cover. And then you can cut out the book cover, and then you can place it inside of the tumbler. So you own your own your own color, I guess. Um, so this this event went on for only three weeks or something, but we had like 20,000 people coming, and we only served um, hot, tall-sized latte. But uh, and then there was a real Starbucks behind it. But uh, everyone, there was a, like a three-hour uh, row of people, and they were waiting for this hot cup of coffee. It was summertime, but it, it was really crazy. But everyone was really. Um, excited about this experience, um, experience about um, choosing your cup of coffee like like a, like a book. I need to speed this thing up. Um, the thing would be about concealing. Um, I would think 
if a client tells me I want you to really feature in this something, I sometimes try to hide that. It's about masking the rest maybe, or it's about totally hiding it. So for instance, this is an interior design that I did for a clinic. I, I hid the, the doors. The doors are not the doors, but uh, the, the wall split open. So it's something like that. Or um, this was a table that I designed for a brand called KME in, in Italy. Um, they wanted to make brass, they wanted to show brass. So I didn't want to make something that has a lot of brass shown, but I, I spray painted the rest of the part, most of the part, and so that the, the brass is showing just a little bit, so that people would be focused. So it's about how to, how to uh, attract the focus. It's about uh, condensing it so that, um, so that it creates another story to that product. This was an exhibition design that I did for El Decor magazine. Um, I didn't want to make walls or pedestals, but I just cut out 80 something uh, sheet boards, like, like people. So I made crowds, so um, people would feel interested in what's hidden uh, inside of that crowd. And also it creates these blurry spaces. So I think this is a mixture of outlining spaces and concealing things or this was a table that I did for Italian brand Moroso. Um, the tabletop is finished in mirrors, and what I did was I put these floral patterns on the bottom underneath the tabletops, which is usually um, not the nice place to design things, but I thought that the bottom part of the table is quite interesting when you see um, through the reflection of the mirror. Or this was a house that I made everything is concealed, all the functions are concealed inside of, um, on one side and in one wall so you can pull out the televisions, kitchens, stairs and so on. So something like this I guess. And this is the second floor, the air conditioning is inside as well, shelves, tables, decks, even the beds uh, would jump out from the walls. Um, so at daytime it's something like this and in this veranda we had uh, a bathtub that would jump out as well but we had a lot of problems with the bathtub because we noticed that uh, when we have this hot water inside of the bathtub it's really heavy when it starts to move it doesn't stop so we had to make first we had to make these rails for the bathtub which sounds crazy and then since the rails are so smooth it doesn't stop so we had to make this this concrete thing with this silicone rubber on both sides so it bumps into this and it stops the bathtub it, it was it was kind of crazy but uh, yes we had the bathtubs jumping out into the uh, the yard as well um, I really like designing the the skin it's not about having the function inside and just wrapping it just finishing it with a certain skin but sometimes the skin can have an, an uh, function, maybe an emotional value to that. So this is like a table made of acrylic but it has the wooden grains on the surface so it seems like wood and, and acrylic at the same time. Or this is totally the opposite. It's, it's, we made an acrylic chair the, actually the, the feet, the legs are made of acrylic and the rest is made of wood and we asked people to paint the acrylic so that it becomes exactly the same like the, the rest of the part. And then we have we had it gradingly fading out so that it the, the feet would the legs would disappear. Or this was a project that we used farming nets. We just molded using heat, and we were able to create something like this as well. It was like wire frames almost. We made small bowls, small vases. Uh, small tables. We had this acrylic box and we wrapped it up with this um, the, the farming net which was pleated as well. So it has this slight texture on the surface. Or this was uh, a chair that I designed. It has a seven millimeter thick steel rod inside and I had them cover um, 
the, the steel rod using these curved out wood, so it was like a pencil almost. So we had these craftsmen to 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 clad these these rods. So it was something like fif fifteen millimeter thick in the end. It was it was quite interesting as well. Or we made lamps using shape memory alloy. So uh, when we turn, when we switch the lights on. It, it generates heat so that it opens by itself like a flower. Or this was an, uh, for an exhibition in Milan at the Triennale Design Museum. We made these bowls out of very, very thin silicone rubber. The exhibition was about sex and design. So I thought, Nendo and sex is so... But this was my answer to... Um, it was trying to create a feeling that you want to touch something, to, to make you want to approach something. So uh, it was kind of interesting. The, the movement that's created when you just touch it, it just keeps on going like that. Okay, um, balance. It's about finding new balances. It's about, this was a project that I did in Paris one year ago. It was about not to create furn strong furniture that has objects on top of it, but uh, furniture that is so weak that it depends on the objects. Or we made a, um, a container so that the door opens by itself. It's like a broken door. Um, and then we had these objects so that it pla when it's placed in front of the door, it stops it. So it's not about making uh, a door with a doorknob or with a lock or something. I just wanted to have an object that holds the door like that, like a door stopper almost. So it was about finding a new balance between objects and furniture or a new um, way of thinking about seeing objects and, and furniture, a new relationship between people and objects. Um, this was about structure as well. Um, we made a stool out of styrofoam. Of course, when you sit on it, you cannot sit on styrofoam. But we had, uh, we made these almost like stickers out of carbon fiber, which was one millimeter thick. And then, so it was like making a pattern, like almost like wallpaper. But that wallpaper becomes the structure itself. So it's not about creating a strong frame and then finishing it, but starting from something very weak and then finishing it with the structure itself. Or this was for an exhibition for Alcantara, uh, a fabric company, and uh, we made these birdhouses that stick to the wall. But what it is, it, it uses, it has this non-slip character because it's like suede. So uh, we use the friction so that it sort of sticks to the surface, so it wasn't about having nails or screws or glue, but the material itself is sticking to each other. So that, that was again uh, thinking about a way about new balances. Um, folding, this is uh, one of my approaches when I especially work with furniture. It's about seeing things in a two-dimensional way, starting from two-dimensional, then folding or, or, or rolling or um, doing things like uh, maybe like a small kid would do with a piece of paper. But that helps me to make things uh, simple in a simple way. I think that simplicity is sometimes very interesting because I think that design is something like information. The more simple it is, the more easier that people would understand. So that is the reason why I like to use two-dimensional things. And this is the last keyword, which is about magnifying things. Um, I feel that uh, when the scale changes, the name changes and the function changes. Let's say there's a stool, but when it becomes slightly taller than that, it becomes like a side table. And then when it becomes bigger than that, it becomes like a dining table. <laughs> so when you have like 20 stools becoming like a, uh, a, a dining table, gradiently, it becomes very difficult for you to understand which piece that you can sit on or which piece you can have dinner on. It, the scale creates a, a totally new function, I guess. So this was a cafe that I made, uh, which has a very huge sofa, but uh, 
it is like a playroom that kids can play inside. Um, it was something, uh, it was about scale again. When, a, um, when an adult sees this, it seems like you're a small child again. So there's a lot of small objects and big objects in this space. Um, this is the last piece, I guess. Um, this is what I made last year with Coca-Cola. They wanted me to make uh, dishes out of 100% recycled um, bottles, Coca-Cola bottles. So what I did was not to create new forms, but I thought that the bottom part of the bottle really represents Coca-Cola in a way. So it was like slicing the bottle and the shape that is left is the dish itself. So this was the final form that I made. I made it, I used very thick glass and the edge is very soft so it reminds you of the Coca-Cola bottles. And also on the bottom I had those, I don't know how you call them, but those small bumps that are on the bottom of the bottles as well. So it reminds you when you, when you drink Coca-Cola from the bottles, you see those small dots and then when you see these bowls, it's, so these are the dots, I guess. Um, so I tried to create a link between the bottles and these dishes. So it was about magnifying a part of the bottle. So um, I guess that is the way I design things. And I guess that's the way I will keep, in, keep on design things in the future. And um, the thing is, I guess, um, I, I said that I want to make people happy, but um, in the end I think I'm the happiest guy. I, I'm really excited when I design things and um, I'm very proud about that. Thank you very much.